we wanted to welcome everybody yeah. who's here on Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us. We're just getting settled in the room, but we are very excited to have Professor, I'm going to call you Professor, even though you just, you know, your adjunct, that is so, <laughs> Dr. Julia Dilly here with us, who uh, we are very fortunate to have, for those of us who have been studying cannabis for quite a while, um, she is someone who's been living in the trenches in terms of implementation and uh, evaluation monitoring in addition to doing the science. So in her work as an epidemi epidemiologist and a senior um, research uh, associate at Melmoth County in Oregon she, and with the Oregon State School, uh, Department of Public Health, she's been doing research and advising on cannabis monitoring and regulation, but she's also a PI at the University of Washington Center for Cannabis Research and um, teaches in their School of Public Health, which is why I'm saying that's our classy as a professor. Anyways, her work has been instrumental for informing not just us as researchers, but people on the ground, and she's very proactive in getting this work out to the people who need it, not just within her own county and her own state, but also through CANRA. She's a regular consultant with the uh, multiple state cannabis regulatory association and provides some guidance on what they're doing. So very excited to hear what you're going to share with us today. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, thanks. I'm, I'm excited to be here and I uh, look forward to hearing any of your thoughts about all these things we've been looking at um, with regard to cannabis legalization. So I want to be sure and, and acknowledge my partners, including our funder for, the, for our main grant from NIH, uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, and then also my partners at um, Multnomah County and Oregon Health Authority, and uh, also other agencies, including the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board in Oregon, Cannabis and Liquor and Cannabis Commission. So um, this is goes without saying, but just to acknowledge up front, um, I'm assuming that if you're sitting here, you're probably um, already of the mind that cannabis use can be harmful for young people, uh, especially early initiation and frequent use for young people. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time laying the groundwork for that. Um, and also that states and jurisdictions that are acting to legalize adult use, um, we are assuming that we want to also balance preventing harm among young people. So we want what we need are the best regulatory approaches that do provide that balance between um, a safe marketplace for adults where it's legal and then any harms to youth. So, so from a theoretical perspective, this is super high, you know, cartoonishly <laughs> simplified, but um, we do think that there's this link. So I come from public health. Uh, I'm concerned about public health outcomes. We do think there's this link between policies, including cannabis legalization, and then that how that leads to public health outcomes. So through influence on the environment, you know, all those policies and regulations that are developed um, after legalization get built into rules and um, procedures that inform what happens in the environment that can in turn affect how people believe what things people believe about cannabis and what's normal about cannabis use, um, which can affect behaviors, and then those can go on to affect public health outcomes. So pre applying prevention theory then to retail cannabis sales in communities, we think that cannabis retail sales and specifically having those retail sales stores in a community could reasonably affect cannabis use among youth because you have not only a store that you can walk in the door of, but the retail associated advertising and the effect that that has on people, normalizing um, use and decreasing potentially perceived harms. Um, we also think that having those stores in communities could, if it increases adult use, including potentially parent use, could affect then youth use by a, you know, norms that happen in family settings um, or even just having if parents have cannabis in the home, then youth might get into cannabis products in the home. Also, retail sales could affect availability directly by social sources, including if prices go down and then kids can give uh, you know, an older sibling or uh, you know, cousin or friend uh, money to buy for them. So that could have sort of a direct effect. Um, and we think that those effects might vary by age group or other youth or community factors as well. So these are all kind of things to plug into your mind as we're looking at this uh, relationship that I'll be talking about today. So I wanted to share about is uh, things that are happening with cannabis legalization in the Pacific Northwest. When I say the Pacific Northwest, I'm thinking of Washington and Oregon. They're in the top left corner of the continental US and you are here, so <laughs> look north and that will be Washington, Oregon. Um, just for context, these are both um, 
similarly sized states, Oregon's a little bit bigger geographically, but Washington has not quite double the number of people um, compared to Oregon. These are both quite a bit smaller, I will say, than the state of California. <clears throat> so just the kind of the factual elements of um, cannabis legalization in the two states, Washington, alongside Colorado, was one of the first two states to act to legalize adult use, um, so meaning use by people 21 and older. Um, that they did so in November of 2012 through a, through a voter initiative, and then um, possession and use by adults became legal. So the voter initiative, initiative passed in, in November. One month later was the date when adults could then possess and use. And then sales didn't begin until July of 2014. So there was there was some lead up time there where you know all the rules were getting worked out about how how do stores get licensed. Where did they get their products from? How did those products potentially get processed and delivered to retail settings and then sold to legal consumers? Um, all of those things are regulated by the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board. That's the agency in the state that was already regulating alcohol and tobacco. So they just added cannabis regulation to their portfolio. In Oregon, Oregon legalized two years later in November of 2014. They were uh, alongside Alaska, the third and fourth states to um, legalize in the US. Um, in Oregon, they took a little bit longer to implement adult use possession. So that was July of 2015. So we had about you know, six or seven months to, to before that took place. And then uh, they did move a little faster on getting retail sales started. So Oregon did it in two steps. The first step was in October 2015. Um, through existing regulated medical cannabis sales outlets, they were allowed to also sell to adults for non-medical reasons. So um, what was interesting about that is in comparison to Washington, where it took a while to get all those stores up and running in Oregon on a particular date in October of 2015, all of a sudden you had a couple hundred places in the state where anybody could go and buy cannabis and there was already supply in existence. So that was a pretty fast change. Um, and then the full retail sales began. Um, so those are licensed non-medical uh, retail sales outlets that all began in October 2016, about a year later. And um, all these things there are regulated by the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission, or OLCC, which um, already regulates alcohol. So I've just alluded to that there are these processes. So legalization gets passed. The voters vote yes on this thing. And then there's a bunch of details to work out um, after that. So um, the two states have ended up with um, a number of different sort of specific rules and approaches to cannabis legalization. Um, and here I'm showing you a table that just compares um, Washington to Oregon from a prevention lens. So I'm putting a check mark in the column uh, for the state that I think, you know, relative to the other column has a more prevention aligned cannabis regulation. I'm not saying if it's good or bad, I'm just saying it's more sort of prevention aligned. So um, it, it, the first thing you might notice is Washington appears to have a lot more checks in the boxes. So um, relative to Oregon, sort of in a very general perspective, Washington probably has a more prevention aligned cannabis regulation that includes several specifics. So in Washington, you can't grow at home, you can't grow cannabis at home for non-medical purposes, whereas in Oregon you can. Um, Washington established caps on the number of cannabis retail uh, outlets that could be licensed. So there's only a certain number that can be licensed and that's all there is. And they allocated those using a, a, a lottery system. Whereas in Oregon, they're just licensing as many as the market will bear and as many as the state agency is capable of processing applications for, which is a different limitation. Um, in Washington, so by both states, say that you can't operate a cannabis retail store within a thousand feet of a K-12 school. Um, but Washington also adds on a bunch of other places where you can't, that you can't operate a cannabis retail store close to. So including parks and playgrounds and childcare, libraries and game arcades, um, and locals can modify this list too. But Washington has a longer uh, list of places where you can't uh, set up cannabis retail stores. Washington currently has uh, more restrictions on advertising. So the content of the kinds of billboards that you can have, the kinds of ads that you can have. I have some examples to show you here in a moment. Um, I've got a little asterisk there because I'm here comparing the current status and Washington started out with a looser um, advertising policy. And then after uh, people started talking about that and being dissatisfied with it, they, um, they clamped down on that a little bit more in 2017. So the current status is that Washington is, is more restrictive than Oregon. And then Washington also has higher cannabis retail sales taxes, 37% versus 17% at the state, plus up to three more percent at the local level in Oregon. So pretty big difference in their, uh, in their tax policy. Um, both states, though, do allow uh, the authority to ban sales and apply other restrictions at, by cities and counties. 
So what were the early signs of change? So I just told you about these two states passed cannabis legalization for adults, kind of similar in time, slightly different um, regulatory approaches. What have we seen so far now that it's 2023? So I would characterize um, the findings so far as sort of mixed. Um, and I think this, we're still not settled on how and, and, and yes, how does cannabis legalization affect you? So um, what we do know, what I feel confident talking about is that a lot of youth see cannabis ads. We did surveys, we added uh, questions to the school-based survey in Oregon about how many kids were seeing cannabis ads and lots and lots of kids are seeing cannabis ads even though they, uh, that is not a legal product for them. We've seen in the literature uh, documentation of both increased and then decreased youth cannabis use in Washington. So Magserta used the Monitoring the Future survey to document increases um, in Washington. And then um, we, our, our team used the state-based um, bigger survey and Rosalie was part of that to, to document declines. Those were sampled differently. And I think the differences we found were, re were relevant to how those surveys are designed and sampled. But um, anyway, just knowing that there's some conflicting. So, so once we've, so those were both state level analyses. And then what's been more interesting is, is um, newer papers that are coming out looking at within state variation and really tying whatever happens in trends to the local environments and what kids are exposed to. So we have a couple of articles out there documenting um, youth cannabis use in Oregon and county level retail sales. And then also some cross-sectional, um, uh, one cross-sectional study looking at proximity to cannabis retail from schools and seeing advertising. And then we have some, um, limited evidence that maybe specific groups are more at risk than others. So uh, Janessa Graves from Washington State University used Washington school based survey and found that um, high school students who are, had part time jobs, their cannabis use increased following legalization, unlike kids who didn't work part time jobs or younger kids. So that's, sort of a that's similar to alcohol, by the way. Oh, OK. We should talk about that, but there's a whole group interested in this. <laughs> So, um, so those are sort of the signs of change in terms of the research. I also thought I'd give you some examples of what the signs of change look like in terms of the signs. Um, so this is this was the billboard in Oregon um, in 2017 where I was like, whoa, I never thought in my lifetime I would see an advertisement like this. And this was right um, as you were going over the bridge into Washington State, actually. So uh, big billboard. They've progressed. Um, so this was a good one. This also starts to get out where the prices were falling. So not only is it you know legal to advertise, but also we can talk about the price falling. And then um, I don't think that free is usually a price that people offer, but um, this was fairly recent. Um, and uh, again, another Portland um, canvas retail outlet. This was from Washington. This was the billboard that got people agitated and talking to their legislators. And I, I would sort of, I think, it, a lot of people attribute the regulations that got clipped down in Washington to this bill board um, and got an awful lot of attention from um, children and other people. And then this is an example of, um, this is my son's middle school school bus driving out of the corridor where his middle school bus went every single day along with a lot of other middle school kids and buses. Um, so this was actually uh, post the change in advertising regulations in Washington. So even with, so it, in Washington, you could no longer put a cute kitty on the billboard, but you could still put interesting words. And this um, looks like the, well, it's kind of playing off the got milk advertisement. And it also looks like the Washington State drivers, uh, what do you call that, license plate yeah, on the vehicle. So um, so there's that. So the, even despite having more restrictions, there's still like advertising that's apparent for kids. In addition to billboards, this was, uh, this is, just down the highway from my house out in rural Washington State. Um, so yeah, we had these sign waivers in front of the Burger Kings and the like people taking advantage of, there was a weed store down the street and then taking advantage of some fast forward food that was available. Um, so in addition to like sort of moving advertisements, just some of the storefronts themselves in Oregon, Oregon is more um, uh, liberal than, than Washington with regard to what you can do on the storefront. So this is an example of a pretty cool looking retail store it's got um what do you call those the light up signs um i'm completely blanking on what that called anyway you know um, but it's very interesting looking and um so this is another uh retail store which again has sort of like that cute colorful sign out front it's not super obvious it's a cannabis store but the yellow circle um, is showing you a toy store so this is a neighborhood area in portland and the toy store is just two doors down and i would i wouldn't 
I would have maybe confused the opening open now sign on the store for the toy store. So, um, so these are all like how communities might change, how things that kids are seeing in the environment might change post legalization. So I mentioned um, that there has been uh, some different progression of, of what that looks like in the two states. On the left, um, this is showing you the number of active cannabis retail licensees in the two states um, from when they opened up through, I think this is through, yeah, December of, or no, July of 2020. So the green line, Washington State, is just showing you what I already told you, which is that the, the market opened kind of slowly. Um, so it took a while, it took a couple years for that market to get up and running. And then they've topped out at you know 400 and something odd because again, they have that cap. So they cannot go any higher than that. It's just gonna bounce around there as a few stores open and close. In comparison, the blue line, Oregon also showing, and I should mention the numbers are the, the numbers in December of each year, just to give you a concrete number to look at. In Oregon, um, in the blue line, the solid blue line are the active uh, state re retail licensees. So you see they went up pretty quickly and they've continued to rise um, even through 2020. That little dash line on the left um, is if you take into account the early retail sales that went into place through medical cannabis stores. So if you, if you count those as well, then the total would be would include that dotted line. So do you accept that, I, I don't know if this is still a problem, maybe it wasn't like that, but I know in LA, when they sort of legalized retail sales, there were still a bunch of unlicensed stores. Is that an issue in Oregon and Washington too, or is anyone tracking that? Um, I think both of the, the regulatory agencies that are in charge of that, the OLCC and the LCB, uh, Washington never acted to regulate the medical market. They had a pretty vigorously um, operational um, gray market. It wasn't exactly illegal, but it wasn't exactly legal. They did a very thorough process of shutting down those retailers, um, and they gave them several years of notice um, and then worked to integrate them into the existing retail. But I think as part of that, they were also pretty carefully monitoring um, whether anybody was continuing to operate those. So I feel pretty good in Washington that we don't have a lot of storefronts that are not licensed. Um, also, because Washington does have this very strict control over who, how many licenses there are and who gets them, I feel like it, it would be difficult to fly below the radar. Um, Oregon had, a, had, a, had just brought their medical market into regulation in about a year before um, the, re the adult use retailer started to, to get in play. So they were bringing all of those folks into the regulated medical market beforehand. Um, and then all but one of them has converted since over into the retail marketplace. But um, I, I'd be surprised if there were operational storefronts that they weren't aware of. Um, so I don't, I don't think, I guess all that to say, I don't think it's as much of a problem up north in the, the Northwest as it has been in California. Uh, oh, the last thing I wanted to say is, again, recall that Washington's population is quite a lot bigger than Oregon's population. So when you're looking at this blue line, which is, again, the number of retail licensees versus the green line in Washington, um, you know, recall that Washington's population is not quite double that of Oregon, but Oregon has quite a few more retailers than Washington. So just an example of how regulations can really affect the total number of um, of licensees that are operating. On the right side um, is just showing you a map. This is county level. Uh, uh, density per 100,000 people across the two states. The top, I should really make a better border, but the top part is, is Washington, the bottom part is Oregon. So this was in um, 2017, so several years after the retail marketplace had opened. Um, you can't probably read the scale very well, but essentially like more darker uh, shading means that there are more licensees per population. So you, what you can see is that there are a number of uh, white looking or, or non-shaded counties on the east side of both states. Um, that is related to uh, just the, the climate. I'd say the population uh, distribution in, in Washington and Oregon, the east side of the state tends to be more rural, uh, more politically conservative. They did not vote in favor as a rule of cannabis legalization for adults. Whereas on the, the left side or the west side um, this includes the metro areas like Portland and Seattle. Um, and most of those counties did vote for passage. So there's been some pretty important geographic variation in uh, where, again, I mentioned locals can opt out. They didn't have to allow local retailers to operate. So when you see those lighter or non-shaded areas, what you, what, what you can infer is that those are the places where the cities and counties said, we are not gonna allow those businesses to operate here. 
that makes sense. Oh, and so for the remain, so now I'm going to get into some of our uh, data, and here I'm going to focus on the study period of 2016 to 2018, and I'll say something about that in a moment. So our research question um, that I'll talk about today is, does having adult use cannabis sales outlets in a community, is that associated with increased cannabis use and risk factors among youth? So um, to do this, we're looking at a comparison of state to state prevalence and trends. Um, we're looking at time varying associations with community retail presence within the state. So exploiting that within state variation. Um, so not just looking at statewide like pre post, but looking at that within state variation over time. Um, and we're using a model here that uh, we had already um, used and published on to show increased use among adults in Washington state uh, post legalization. Our hypotheses were that cannabis use and risk factors among youth will increase with greater cannabis retail presence. And we thought that those associations might vary by age group and other community or individual factors. So the methods. So we leaned heavily on our state's school-based youth surveys. Um, Washington and Oregon both have very strong, robust school-based surveys that they do in the states. These are different from uh, the CDC Youth Risk Behavior Survey or YRBS that you might be familiar with. A lot of the questions are the same, but they've um, both these states prioritize getting local level data with their school-based survey system. So they use a slightly different approach. In Washington, they survey sixth, eighth, 10th, and 12th graders every two years. Here, we're gonna focus on eighth and 10th graders so that we have a middle school group and high school group. Um, we're looking at the data from 2016 and 18. And for both of those years, we have you know, more than 50,000 kids um, per grade in our data set. Oregon, similarly, they, they instead sample sixth, eighth, and 11th graders. We're gonna focus here on the 11th and eighth graders, again, to look at middle school and high school. Um, similarly, well over 100 schools um, participated in each year and we had in the thousands of um, students that generated data. Um, both of the surveys are, these are self-administered surveys. They're anonymous. Kids take them in the classroom. They're in English or Spanish. Um, and they have pretty similar questions uh, across the two states about cannabis use and um, risk factors and demographics. And um, I should mention too that both states draw a state sample, but we included all the available data. So including volunteer schools, which in Washington state, it's something like 70% of all kids in the state take the survey. So hence the very large sample size. So why did we focus on 2016 and 18? Um, so just briefly, we wanted to look at post legal sales start so that we had um, uh, up to six years of post legalization and four years from the start of full retail sales. Um, we did wanna wait until, we were trying to isolate the effect of the retail cannabis presence in communities. So we wanted to go just after um, the implementation of legalization itself. Um, and then we, we, we used through 2018 because that's pre-COVID and school-based surveys were really disrupted during the COVID pandemic when kids weren't in school and the, the methods, everything was all messed up. So uh, we wanted to not <laughs> be detecting a bunch of stuff from that. So hence, that's why I'm stopping with 2018 today. Our outcomes, um, we used binary outcomes up to nine per state and grade. So two for cannabis use, current use, which is any use on uh, any days in the past 30 days, and then frequent use, which is either 10 or more days or 20 or more times in the past 30 days. So two different outcomes there. <clears throat> and then we have a bunch of outcomes for risk factors, sort of in three categories. The first is injunctive norms. So these are beliefs that youth have about what their peers think, what their parents think. And in Washington, we also asked what adults think in their community, how wrong would it be if you used cannabis, someone, a young person. Um, use cannabis. And we collapsed very wrong and wrong as our as our outcome of interest. We also have descriptive norms, so perceived harm from either just trying cannabis or from using it regularly. And then last, access. So whether kids believe that um, cannabis is, is available, if it would be very easy or easy for them to get it if they wanted to. Our exposure measure. Um, we, we did this a couple of different ways, and I'm just going to focus on one way today. Um, so we got state licensed cannabis retail lists from both the Washington and the Oregon regulatory agencies. It was really important that we spent time cleaning these up. I think this is, a, in my mind, a problem with some of the cannabis studies you will see that do look at retail licensees, especially early in the market. Licenses get awarded, but they may not start sales. Their addresses are changing frequently. In Washington, they had an interesting thing where the state would award the license, but then the local city or county might be banning that licensee from operating. So if you just look at the licensee list, you're going to get kind of a bit of a mess. 
because you do need to clean it up. So we went through and cleaned everything up very carefully so that we had geocoded and we confirmed addresses and then we documented months of sale when each licensee was making sales per location um, over our study period. Um, and then we characterized exposure using that list. We linked it to the school buildings. So we had our school survey data were linked to building address, school building address. So then we looked at those two things. We've got both geocoded <clears throat> and uh, we looked at the licensees that were um, making sales two months prior to the school surveys administration period. And we categorized it uh, in one way as a continuous variable. So using the inverse. So what that means is that um, if the school is here and one mile away is the nearest cannabis retailer, we took the inverse of that. So if, if it's one over one, that would, the value would be one. I've got some examples here. What, the reason why we did that is we wanted the, the change from say a, having a retailer half a mile to a one mile distance away from a school, that's a pretty big change. But once you get away to where it's like 10 miles versus 11 miles away, that doesn't really make a meaningful difference on exposure. So by using the inverse, we were creating a more sensitive measure of the closer you got and then the further away you got it just it doesn't change very much in terms of the exposure. So a lot of the studies published already, Yu Yin Shi, for example, has done some studies using Modern in the Future mm -hmm. and has used the radius. Have, do you do that just as a check to see if you get some? We did it the other way too, where we just use categorical distances. Um, so let's see. I, I look for it. We'll my... see it. We'll see it. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't talk about it here today, but we did do it both ways just to make sure it wasn't like just that we're doing it the way that works. Because that's how a lot of the early, I, I love this idea of exposure. It's very intuitive once you've explained it, but so many have used that five mile or 10 mile radius yeah. or one mile radius even in the past. And so I'll be curious to know how that, how it compares yeah. thresholds that are assumed versus a you know, more continuous measure. It, it is very difficult to find the meaningful thresholds. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the best thresholds were, looking at other published studies and also looking at tobacco and alcohol studies. It's really tough, and I think the thresholds are different, maybe in a rural community versus an urban community. So, um, yeah, we did look at it both ways, but I'm, yeah, I'm <laughs> sticking with this one. Oh. How did you um, identify the active sale data? So for cleaning the data set, you know, um, what, is that included in the licenses list, or did you have to actually call the dispensaries? Or oh gosh, no. <laughs> so again, we worked with our regulatory partners, um, and in different ways they they have to track sales per licensee because they get taxes they collect taxes um you know from those licensees so we had to get separate lists of uh taxes taxable sales reported per licensee per month and then link those back to our cleaned location lists and did you like kind of quantify sort of like the amount of sort of like error or misclassification that would occur or like you know how many I'm just, I'm curious, like, if you had any idea of, like, how much of a difference cleaning up the data resulted in your estimates, mm -hmm. um, like, how much of a difference did it make, you know? You know, it felt like a big difference, but I don't think we, <laughs> we didn't, I felt like it was definitely worth doing. Okay. Um, that's a great question. It would be fun to do it. Like on yeah, a dirty list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We did it in Colorado. Not, we didn't have sales, so that's even better. Okay than what we did. We just did the whole, you got a license, but did you open and okay. look at it in Colorado? And there's a big difference okay. in terms I'd love of to talk people. about this for my pay research. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just wonder if you have cost data at the, at the level of the site. We don't. So price, you mean like product price data? Yeah, um, we don't. It, the, the systems that are being used to track, and Rosalie, knows more about this than I do really, but you've been in the than me. It's a mess. I'll just say that's a mess. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very difficult because um, products are differently designed. So like a drink in one store might be so big and have so much THC in it and in a different store, you know, a different brand, a different package, different state. It's really difficult to... You know, when you look at a drink, it's not by analysis. Well, then you also get weird, like the tinctures and the right. other. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that have, there's no standardization. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. I mean, we do we do sometimes look at. I've done this more at the state level, but looked at average price per gram of flour. That's. I mean, it's still not perfect, but um, yeah. But for this analysis, we didn't.
Is that the variable on uh, amount of sales per day or the volume? We have, um, so we have amount of sales per month. Um, I haven't used that in this in this analysis. We've looked at it more for geographic, uh, just geographic patterns, and seen things like border effects. You know, where all the stores next to Idaho <laughs> are doing a booming business, which I'm sure are yeah. include a lot of Idahoans <laughs> coming over the border to buy. But I didn't include it here. It is it is a. So the data does exist, though, huh? about the volume of sales per month. You can get total. It, it's difficult. You can get. I mean, and sometimes we had to like go through a lot of backflips to request sales. There are some protections, especially, and they're different by state, protections on how much they will release to you about sales. <laughs> they'll typically reduce, they'll give you like overall sales, yeah. um, but you don't know how much of that is flour versus tinctures versus right. edibles right. and to whom that went and if those people lived in state or not in state. So. And what's, what, strikes me as crazy about this is you are in those state agencies and you can't exactly. get the data yes. if you can't get it who, who can who can right yeah i think i guess the approach we've been taking is to empower the agencies with the data to understand the important questions yeah. and then they can and we can help them think about that and look at that yeah, and, that's, that's approach, yeah. <laughs> you gotta just slowly give them what data can do for policy? They yeah. don't, they're not used to that. They have monitored. I mean, their their mission has typically been more focused on you know collecting revenue and just sort of monitoring compliance with rules. Um, so asking them to look at their data with a public health lens and think about what is the data telling us that we maybe need to do differently in terms of products we're allowing or places and hours of operation. That's a that's a jump for them. So yeah. <laughs> we try to we try to help. So. So kind of coming back to the data analysis itself. So I was just telling you, we linked the school data and the, the retail data. So we've got, you know, two states, high school and middle school, a couple of time periods. And now we're looking at this association. Um, I've got the picture of our model here. It's a mixed effects regression model using Stata. Um, again, we stratified by both state and grade level. Um, and we had some other covariates in there. So um, student level covariates like race and ethnicity and then gender um, and some school level factors like the school type and geographic region and um, population and poverty by district. So here are some results. Um, <clears throat> these are just selected. So again, we had up to nine outcome variables per state and grade. I'm just showing you four here as examples. Um, in, in all four of these, so each, each little chart is, a sing, is an outcome. Um, the blue bar is the prevalence from 2016 and the orange bar is from 2018. These are clustered so you can see the eighth grade Washington and then Oregon data on the left within each little um, chart and then the 10th grade in Washington and 11th grade in Oregon on the right so middle school and then high school together. Um, where you see a little box with a plus or a minus that indicates a statistically significant change from 2016 to 2018 for um, that grade and state and indicator. So, um, for example, under cannabis use, we did see statistically significant increases in um, past 30 day use of cannabis for Washington eighth graders and 10th graders going from 2016 to 18. We didn't see a change for Oregon eighth graders and 11th graders. Um, the injunctive norms, the, the specific one we're offering as an example is your parents believe it's wrong. So going down means that sort of less prevention, um, you know, we would like that to go up from a prevention lens. So um, three of the four groups we're looking at here showed significant declines. Um, and the Oregon one for 11th graders, even though it didn't decline, it's pretty low. <clears throat> then on the bottom left, the descriptive norms here, we're showing you the, per the perception of great risk from regular use of cannabis that went down for all for both states and in both grade groups significantly. And then for um, access on the bottom right, um, wh whether kids think it's easy to get, uh, that did increase for Washington eighth graders and then decline significantly for Oregon 11th graders. So one thing, in, in addition to looking kind of year to year within state and grade, um, one thing that's kind of interesting is to think that, is to look at for eighth graders. So this is the same grades of kids across states. Data were collected in about the same period of time. So um, if you look at Oregon eighth graders and Washington eighth graders, the Oregon eighth graders seem to have a relatively greater risk versus Washington. 
So here um, uh, we see this is current cannabis use. So the Oregon eighth graders look a little higher. So Washington kids went up, but they're sort of approaching the where the Oregon kids are. Um, here is uh, parents believe it's wrong. So that looks a little lower to me for Oregon versus Washington. And then quite a difference for um, perceiving great risk from cannabis use um, and then perceiving cannabis is easy to get. So this is just suggestive. I think that there are just some different maybe contextual things about um, kids and growing up in these two different states, even though they both have legalization and they both are, they're kind of demographically similar. Did you control for urban? We did have um, an urban rural uh, variable in our models. Like would that affect that? Like, or, or, mm -hmm. but you know, like these is, is, are the kids in Oregon more urbanized than the kids in Washington? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the easier way to get at it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know. Because that might relate to the accident. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I. They're not significantly so. I mean, I think what's striking to me is that they're generally pretty similar on the population demographics, which is why Oregon was used as a control state in the early evaluations of Washington. Mm -hmm. But it also indicates that unless you're doing a difference in difference technique, you're not going to see that Washington with anything negative happened to you compared to Oregon, mm -hmm. because Oregon started just so much higher, mm -hmm. even though population, there's as many you fully. I think the difference the difference, the reason why I think that's true is in Washington, in your school-based survey, you have a lot, you do have reservation kids included. Yep. And that's not true in many of the school-based public schools. Mm -hmm. And that's really unique in their data. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the for the tribes that participate, yeah. yeah. And because there's a lot of tribes up there. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. that's a very rural area mm -hmm. as well. I think the I should, it's a great question though. I should go back and look and just make sure, but I don't, I don't think they're, I mean, most of the population in both states live in those urban areas. So like the Seattle, King County, Pierce County, Tacoma, you know, area of Washington, and then the, the Portland Metro area in Oregon. Um, but I will, I will go back and look. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it that way, probably, Oregon's probably less urban than, than Washington, right? Because you do have that, yeah. right? The whole coastal thing in Washington happening. Yeah. I'll have to look. It's, it's a great question. <clears throat> this is sort of the bottom line um, uh, from our models. I'm just showing you the adjusted odds for the outcome associated with retail proximity, and it's bold if, if there's a statistically significant association. So, um, for example, with cannabis use, so again, these are, these are all the up to nine outcomes that we looked at. Um, per state and grade for cannabis use where I just put the green box. Um, so what this means is the adjusted odds for um, cannabis use in the past 30 days associated with um, the exposure to cannabis retail is looks a little higher for eighth grade, but didn't didn't get to significance level of significance for Washington or Oregon, but was significantly greater for Washington 10th and Oregon 11th graders. Um, so cannabis that we do what we are seeing here a significant association between current cannabis use and um, exposure to cannabis retail and then here's um, here i put the green box around parents believing it's wrong so here the odds are less than one because um, parents believing it's wrong is going down or kids believing their parents think it's wrong is going down so that's being reduced um, these are all significant all bold um, so here we're seeing a significant reduction associated with that presence of cannabis retail is that all from the 2018, is it all cross-sectional or? So they're linked at the school building level. So um, from 2016 to 2018, the exposure at the school level varies. And we've, we've so we've linked uh, school level across time, but not at the individual, not linked at the individual kid level. Um, and this is a summary table. This is really just like all the numbers that you saw in the previous, previous previous slide here I'm just boiling it down to to how many of the outcomes were significantly um, and in this case they're all categorized as worse so how many of the outcomes we examined were worse um, from, from a prevention lens among those we tested from the prior table so cannabis use um, Washington eighth graders none of the, neither I should say of the two outcomes we looked at for cannabis use were significant one of the two for Oregon was significant and then for the 10th graders both um, both got worse both outcomes we looked at got worse for both Oregon and Washington. 
Then for injunctive norms, again, that's the perceived wrongness of parents and peers and adults and community. Um, only one out of four for the Washington eighth graders was significant, two out of three for the Oregon eighth graders, and then four out of four for Washington 10th and two out of three. So, um, yeah, and so then we just kind of did the, and then at the bottom line, so if you sum all those up, if you want to think about all these from a prevention perspective, so in the total, among Washington eighth graders, two of the nine outcomes we looked at were significant, six of the eight outcomes we looked at for Oregon eighth graders were significant. And then for the 10th graders in Washington, seven of nine, and for the 11th graders in Oregon, four of eight. So you have middle schools and high schools that are actually in the same areas. Uh, like co-located? Yeah, co-located. <clears throat> right now it's school level, but we don't know if they're co-located co -located or not. It would be really interesting to know if it's the 11th graders in the exact same areas mm -hmm. that don't see anything, things aren't getting worse. But for the 8th graders, it is. It might help think about mm -hmm. why, because uh -huh. this is this is a curious finding, but right now we don't know that they're in the same location. Right. I could look at that. We did we did include school type, so we had like combined, like six, yeah. you know, so where there's a middle school, high school combined, we have that <coughs> just as a covariate in the model, but we could stratify and start looking at that. I think that's I think that's a good idea. We should have we should have good power. We do have lots of buildings yeah. and kids. <laughs> Thank you. So so that was like the bottom line of the finding. So what does it mean? What have we learned? Um, so I think that what we found here just is adding a little more evidence um, and a little more flavor to the evidence about cannabis legalization and youth. I think what we did that was new was we looked at these community level effects. So within state effects across two states, um, we were really isolating the retail exposure. Um, and we looked at longer term effects compared to other studies that, I mean, when you look at a lot of the cannabis legalization studies about youth, they happened like the year after, or maybe two years after. And so here we're going, you know, up to four or six years after. I think that's very important because the changes that were experienced by a high school kid when it becomes legal while I'm in high school, that could be pretty different than for a, a kid like my son who grew up, went to middle school, seeing all these things, you know, has been continuously exposed to the market. That, you know, the, the things that happen could be different. Um, over time. So I think I'm happy we can contribute something there. Um, our findings do complement our prior find. So some of the pri prior cross-sectional findings and broader geographic area examinations. These are also pretty similar results to what we got when we looked at this with adults. We linked adult health behavior survey about cannabis use with um, cannabis retail location and, and found kind of similar uh, types of findings. Um, and I think one thing that's curious to me is, again, we talked about Washington had sort of a relatively more restrictive or more prevention centered regulatory design. Um, it looked like Washington eighth graders had fewer significant associations in the outcomes we looked at. So only two of nine of those prevention things got worse, if you will, um, versus in Oregon, six of the eight among the same age of kids got worse. So maybe there's a, you know maybe that is the result of washington's regulatory framework i don't know um the the changes that occurred among the older youth don't appear that different so maybe maybe what we're seeing is something to do with um, differential response to retail cannabis by age group going are there differences between oregon and washington in the preferred prevention school based programming um, is life skills the main one at, in both mm. states, or is there a differential? I'd be fascinating to know, because you, if you have schools, you know school districts, you can find out what their mm. education is, because it is striking that it's so different. Yeah. You know, that's a great question, and I think where I might start, or I should start probably, is looking at the infrastructure for prevention per school, per state. I'm, I'm a little more familiar with Washington and they do like there's there are there's there are dedicated staff within school districts and systems that are doing prevention. They, they probably do life skills or something else like that. I, I don't think Oregon has quite the same. So I, I, I would I could think of a way to objectively try to tease yeah. out. <laughs> I think that's a great question. So taking what we've learned and then trying to back out. So, okay, we learned something about two states. So, so what, like what, what else should we be thinking about? So I guess I wanted to, 
um, just point out though here we looked at these two states and we thought that was a good like these are good states to look at next to each other because they're sort of demographically similar geographically similar but they had slightly different regulatory frameworks <clears throat> So some of the other states since that time that are coming on board, they also have different frameworks, different from Washington and Oregon and from each other. So the chart you're looking at is from a different paper we're looking at um, where we're summarizing the presence of cannabis retail licensees by state. Um, so these are data from June of 2022, so about a year old, but you know gives you a, gives you a sense of it. Um, so this is a, for five of the first eight states that legalized in the US. The white number within the column is the number of licensees in that state, and then the blue column itself is charting the per 100,000 population per state. So, um, so what you'll see, for example, is Alaska on the top. They have the fewest number of licensees at this time, 118, but um, because their population is quite small, when you look at it per, pop, you know, the per population number of retailers, they're looking pretty big. Um, Oregon if you want to say it this way, is winning with the number, greatest number of cannabis retailers and also the revenue. The revenue. Yeah, yeah, they're winning if you if you measure success by revenue. <laughs> um, and then Washington, quite a bit different. When you look at it this way, this is again just state level, just looking at numbers, uh, Washington has quite a, has fewer and their population is bigger. So that difference in the per cap or per population um, number of retailers is even greater. What will be fascinating is to do similar kinds of studies from some of the newer states coming on board. So Massachusetts here looks pretty low. This is pretty early still, like within the first few years of their legalization. Um, their, their market data are changing pretty fast. Um, so I'll be curious to look at their numbers again in another year, particularly since they're really the first eastern seaboard state to legalize. And I'm sure that they've got quite a few people driving across the border <laughs> to come over to, um, to purchase cannabis within their state legally. So just a lot of state level um, variation. So, what's the, so what did we learn? What should I tell my colleagues at the regulatory agency um, that they need to think about? Uh, so thinking about policy and what we're learning and how that might translate into policy recommendations. So I think, the, we know for a fact that there's going to be continued expansion of legal cannabis markets in the US, maybe even federally. Um, we should keep youth in our minds in this cannabis regulatory design. I think it's been very um, much in the media that people want to draw conclusions quickly. Like initially, when cannabis legalization was happening, a lot of the media I was seeing was like, oh no, this guy, you know, like the children, what about the children? And then, you know, it had been like two years. And then I feel like the story sort of changed to like, oh, it's fine. You know, kids are fine. Um, I think, I think neither of those were really accurate. Like, we should be concerned about the young people, and we should keep being concerned about the young people. Um, so, I, I guess I hope that we can add add to the evidence base that says we should keep thinking about this. We, this is not a settled issue, and we need to continue paying attention to it. So, have you looked at like substitution for alcohol? <laughs> yeah. Um, Anyway, yeah. Yeah, we have started to look at that. Um, uh, or we have compliment. I think we're going to. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Both are possible. Yep. We've been. We have started to look at that both with tobacco and alcohol for young people. Um, where we, I mean, I guess I'll just say our preliminary models are showing potentially increases in cigarette smoking for kids when cannabis. Which I was surprised. I thought it would be vaping, but. We saw nothing with vaping, and instead we saw, and I, and I have seen some other literature out there too that are suggesting that cigarette smoking might be, a, might be a complement to um, cannabis use. So, um, yeah. But it's, no declines in alcohol problems or use. Uh, we've looked. I mean, for you, substance use among youth has been declining overall. Um, so. We, did, we, we didn't see any uh, associations in alcohol use patterns with cannabis retail, but I feel like we need more, we need more longitudinal individual stuff because we're, we're, you know, we're, we're doing longitudinal within school, but we don't have kid to kid. Uh, so I, so I guess I feel like I don't know for sure. I feel like I'm worried about the cigarette smoking thing, but I feel like we don't know for sure. But I think doing that analysis is particularly difficult in a way that a lot of people don't think about. We've had alcohol retail outlets for a really long time. There's not as much variability in the number or density in a two year period like there is for cannabis, right? And the, so when you do those differential analyses to try to get at the causal effect, alcohol washes out whether it's no change in a low availability or no change in a high availability. It just the regression treats it as no change. 
And those are pretty important differences for influence and alcohol behavior. We don't have the same thing with tobacco. Part of the reason I think why you're seeing something with tobacco and not with alcohol is vaping is changing everything and you're having changes in availability driven by vaping. So there's variation that we're used to looking at in a comparable way to cannabis. Mm -hmm. So I think when we're doing these sort of comparisons, we have to be really thinking carefully about the, how do we structure the data to get us the question that we want because mm -hmm. of the lack of changes in alcohol. Well, I mean, I do think that, I mean, some of the question is less about even the availability stuff. I mean, the geo, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, and more about just what are the behaviors of the youth, right? Mm -hmm. So like, do, do you see, Kids, kids, kids who want to have, have mood alteration, you know, using more can using cannabis mm -hmm. instead of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And in areas where it's very expensive to get alcohol mm -hmm. and there's lots of compliance checks, absolutely, I think you're going to see that. And then Just areas, it's easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that we haven't we haven't been able to identify which of those regions those kids are coming from. We haven't captured that heterogeneity for alcohol to get at the overall effect. Right. Okay. Cool. In the, in the there's the legal and illegal market. You know, in LA, the illegal market is surpassing the legal market. And it's because of the taxes and everything else, the price is so much higher in the legal dispensaries. And there's a, a you know, a thriving uh, trade in, in the illegal yeah. market. So uh, is, is that, California, I mean, it's kind of a special case. It's been a <laughs> Not in a good way. <laughs> you're still on the West Coast, I see. Yep. I see, so, uh, you know, yeah. we're, we're, yeah. we, we can learn from you now about one of my questions also was about the, the recent uh, hallucinogenic yeah. mushroom laws mm -hmm. in Oregon, and how does that affect, but that's another question. Yeah. But, that is such an important question that I spend time thinking about <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, yes, I guess bottom line is we are like one of our next analysis analytic things we want to wrap up is looking at to what extent can we talk about um, complementarity or substitution um, among different kinds of substances and what is has a role. On that final note, um, do you have any image you don't have like individual level data? Do you happen to have trends of like are these kids vaping? Marijuana? Are they smoking? Is it like their preferred joints? Do they prefer? Mm -hmm. And like maybe that's kind of leading to the like cigarette smoking versus the vaping of mm -hmm. like tobacco and those relationships. I don't know if you have that like that data, but that could be a good Yes, that's a great point. The surveys um, did add. The, the, it took them a little while to get consistent on product type okay. of cannabis, but we do currently have. We have information. I think for I know for 2018, but maybe not consistently for 2016. Oh, I know. It was one of the states. Uh, we wanted the select all that apply. So if you use cannabis, how did you use it? Select all that apply. And one of the states the first year just had the most common or the way you usually use it, which most kids usually will say that they smoke it. But if you ask the check all that apply, then you get like a lot of variation. Um, so I, th I think yeah, it's the mode of use or the product type that they're using is very important to consider. And then there's that monitoring the future study that said if you ask about vaping and then ask about cannabis in vaping you get higher rate yeah. of use of cannabis yeah and it's more complex do you do you guys in your when you ask about vaping in your survey do you washington did ask ask some questions about what was in if for kids that vaped anything okay. like separately asked if what they vaped was nicotine right. cannabis nothing right. like flavor only yeah um and honestly i haven't even looked at that but it is we could that would be fun to look at too yeah. Yeah. i'm curious um about the like variation at the locality at the local level mm -hmm. so like the within state variation in cannabis policies and if you've done any work to try to like exploit that or try to identify whether localities with like specific types of or differentiation in cannabis policy, whether that's associated with behavior and, and how you might go about that, and so sort of like whether you consider looking at any moderation in these analyses. So for example, whether the effect of the proximity to, to dispensary on behavior is attenuated or amplified um, for youth going to school in these localities with like stricter cannabis mm -hmm. policy. 
So our original grant proposal, like the thing that it hinged on was that local policy variation. So we've been collecting in Washington and Oregon, all of the city and county local policies on cannabis since the start of our study and updating them every year. And then we have code books, which are a little different for the two states because the what's allowed and yeah. you know, the framework's a little different. Um, so we have, we have time varying policy coding per community. And then we can of course link school to where they're at in the community. Um, we have actually we presented at ISDSDP a few years ago um, associations between what the local policy was and what the retail environment looks like. Yeah. Um, so that's like a pretty easy link to make. It's a little harder to link policy to behavior because the borders are are fuzzy. Okay. So um, we found things that looked like they were going in a direction, but because you know like I'm not sure what the borders are out here, but like right across the street from here might be a different political right. jurisdiction on the border. You go to school on the border. Right. So then it's like, are you actually the big matter? Really? Right. But, uh, yeah. Right. So measures of exposure are difficult to get precise with, but that linkage between policy and the retail environment, that's a pretty good one because, you know, we're getting down to the right. geographic, like the political boundaries um, there. So it's, I mean, that is kind of like what we think is driving this. But uh, yes, yeah, so in terms of like modeling links. And you're finding that there are those links between the local policies and the retail environment, that there's mm -hmm. adherence and they're like, what, what's the outcome there like, that you're looking at? Uh, so we looked at um, primarily siting restrictions. So uh, looking at you know cities that added, added more <laughs> places to the list where you're not allowed to build, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, and we looked at those like we also looked at community characteristics like demographic populations and urban and rural and what kinds of policies they enacted. Yeah. Um, so kind of, yeah, getting at links there. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Oh, I had a similar question. Okay. Perfect. I have a couple oh, questions online, but I just want to make sure you're we're good with your, do you have more time? Um, I have one more. Okay. One more thing to say, I guess. You can hold and tell, because we have a few more minutes with the last one. Okay. Um, so I guess I guess just one point I wanted to make in, in terms of thinking about what is the meaning of these findings and what do we do with them. Um, the two the two last things I want to leave you with is when I've presented this information before to some in some places, people immediately go to well then we need like bigger siting restrictions, right? Like instead of a thousand feet from a school, we need to make it two thousand feet from a school, or we need to add more things to the list, like from from parks, you know, not allowing retailers to operate in more places. I don't think that's the magic bullet because if you some of our other work or, or work the partners that I've worked with have done is if you if you just create bigger buffer zones around certain places you end up only having a few places where cannabis retailers can operate and and a lot of times those are communities that are already vulnerable in different ways and so you end up disproportionately affecting yeah. um, groups of people that you know so so just picking bigger buffers is probably not the solution. Um, and I guess I'll just offer, think again about those pictures we saw at the beginning, like the presence of a retailer in your community is more than just their street address. It's also like, how visible are they? How much advertising are they putting out? Um, and maybe other kinds of communication. And, and I guess I keep <laughs> starting to bring up like, maybe what we need to, knowing that the way that the way that those retailers then go on to influence youth is sometimes around their peers, around their parents and families. Like maybe we need also to invest in counter marketing or uh, prevention campaigns and other more community focused or school based prevention activities because you just can't, I don't think you can re re regulate retailers enough to completely prevent there from being some effect that kids experience, you know, in, in other settings outside of a particular retail. So. I will stop there. And I, I did also have some limitations and our, um, I think we've talked about our conclusions. So thank you. Thank you. Um, just one quick, uh, two quick questions online, I think. Um, are, has the legalization of cannabis reduced the size of the illegal market? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, <laughs> that's all was the answer. Yes, I was going to say, Bo, Bo Kilmer's email is, um, it has, I was, um, so Bo Kilmer from Rand has done a couple of studies in Washington state where they estimated the size of, they estimated total consumption in the state using the NISDA 
data, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. So they estimated the total amount consumed, and then they looked at how much was sold through retail, and then they estimate the, the non-retail uh, sources um, as the difference, right? But although there's some limitations there, like it doesn't account for home grow, for medical, it doesn't account for um, medical uh, that they might get from a, a collective or something like that. But, but my rec recollection is they did feel like that was going down, but it was still kind of a big, I don't know, I'm, it was less than half, but it, and it was reducing, but it was still like, it's not a, it's not a um, trivial amount that's being that's coming from the illicit market. And in Oregon, there's, it is, it is known that there is a pretty thriving illicit market, much of which is being exported to other states. I know that, um, yeah, that is a thing. Um, and then the second question is, thank you for this very meaningful research. Is cross-state sales considered, especially given different availabilities of retail stores and huge differential sales tax? Mm -hmm. So there shouldn't, uh, cross-state, there can't be cross-state commerce because of, you know, so, so in other words, you can't grow it in one state and then sell it at a retailer in another state. So, so when we're looking at cross-state effects, what that means to me is individual people, like I live in Washington, I drive across the border to Oregon and I go buy cannabis there. Um, our study doesn't, doesn't include that because, and it's difficult because people who are buying, the cannabis purchases are primarily cash transactions. Um, we don't have information about individuals who are purchasing. So um, yeah, I guess bottom line is we haven't looked at that. What we have looked at is, is um, sales of retailers who are closer to borders, particularly with Idaho, for example. Like, the retail stores that are next to Idaho where cannabis is not legal, um, they're doing a very nice business over there. <laughs> and I'm sure some of that is from Idaho. Plus you have an international border. Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> correct. Canada. Oh, cannabis is legally? Yeah, I don't know. Vancouver, it's federally. Yes, sir. Vancouver is a very active uh, yeah. They have coffee shops in four stores, right? Yeah. We did see early on, before cannabis was legal in Canada, there were a couple of um, retailers up kind of, I th I, what I thought was it was probably people coming down on uh, ships from mm. Canada into Washington and some of those kind of Puget Sound area um, sales. And I haven't looked at that in a while, so it's a good question. Currently, Canada, so uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, British Columbia, I should say, which borders to the north, Washington State, I think their legal age of purchase is still 19 up there for cannabis. So it would actually potentially be going in the opposite direction now, where if a young person who's 19 or 20 in Washington might drive across the border and then they could legally purchase in, in British Columbia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.